people who had only hard words teaching. But this went for a few decades. But they, they couldn't um, sound the words out. So they could recognise that they couldn't break it down. So when they got to a longer word, they didn't have the strategies needed to be able to decode that. So um, the systematic phonics came into being in the UK curriculum around about um, 2005 or 2006. And since then, it's a regular compulsory part of the teaching program in the, the UK. So um, as you say, everybody needs it. But let's have a look and delve into what exactly does it mean. So Ed, would you like to go with the first one? So today we're just going to have a quick look about just understand what phonics is and why we teach it. Um, and why did it come to be that every school in the UK has to do it? And I think you you know, this is a um, school, obviously phonics is a key part of their development of reading. Um, how to support children at home and some take home links on the Oxford Hour um, where you can access some free resources there. Um, going to the next slide, this is what I started with. Okay. Now, I started to read um, the complete, it was more whole word recognition, um, but it was also a very, my, my experience was very boring in school. Because we had a reader, and the reader was said, um, Janet is in the kitchen. This is the table. I've never speaking of it, so I've had five years of English or six years of English. This is the table. This is the cooker. This is the sink. This is the... Where's the story? Where's that excitement you mentioned? Hmm? I could read it, but I wasn't excited by it. Instead, my mother, she read to me at home. My parent and my father read to me. That was special. When my father read to me, it was really special because he was busy working most of the time. But, um, so my mum was always there, she would read bedtime story, but sometimes my dad would come home and he'd sit with me and read the story. And we would read it together, and that was what was so exciting. So I, I was lucky to have that experience, but my school experience um, wasn't great because it wasn't very interesting. But somehow we all managed to read at the end. But some of our children really do struggle, so that's why we need to be looking at the phonics. Okay, Ed, moving on. Um, why does reading matter? And, you know, you were mentioning in that sort of how exciting it was and how you loved it. Um, the love of reading is the biggest indicator of future academic success. Now, this came out from, uh, I don't know if you've heard about the PISA program, but it's like independent assessment of children's reading. Um, and it's an independent body called the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, and it's global. And one of the results that they found from their research was that this thing. So we need to instill that early on, that love of reading, because we're building that future success. Now, if your children struggle to read, they're going to struggle with accessing the wider curriculum, mm -hmm. which means they're going to be sort of behind a little bit um, from others. So what we need to do is to make sure that they're reading fluently, with, with uh, comprehension, and that they are able to um, access all areas of the curriculum. It's very important in the digital area too, because like, mobile phones, even the small kids are using them. They need to be able to read those and that as well and access that um, and the internet, of course. So it's really important that we address that. But how do we do it? So um, when you're dealing with sort of books for children, you need to have relevance. It needs to be something that will mirror their world so that they can immediately understand it. So a lot of the books reflecting their own lives uh, in the early stages. But you also need a mirror on the, you need to, not just a mirror on you, but you need a window on the outside world. Because as you know, the children, they start very much with the world around them. But as they, as they develop, they, they move a little bit further away so that 
they get to encompass not just family, but family and friends. Not just family and friends, but family and friends and their place in the school. And then, you know, their children and their own age around the world, so how things are different. So, bit by bit, which we're doing that mirror on their own life, but you're doing that window on the, the world, the bigger, wide world, and then. So, that you can expose them through your books, your reading, to um, the same world as well. So, it's really good to be able to do that. Um, so, that is one of the things into that. Ciolaria. 
and you use the knowledge you have of English. Mm -hmm. So your little children, they don't have large, expansive knowledge, but that's why it helps them. Oh, into the folio. Okay. okay, what is it? There's just a quick picture to show you. It's a plant. It's a pretty plant. Um, we tend to not use the Latin names, we usually give them different easy names for us, us who are gardeners. But what does that do? It means that any time you're reading that now, you're reading a text maybe on chemistry or you're reading some, something complicated on economics, you come across a word that you don't know, you'll be able to sort of sound it out in your head and you'll think, oh yeah, I know that word, because you've heard it somewhere before. So that's kind of useful. Okay, moving on, what is phonics? It teaches how sounds are represented by written letters. Oops. Excellent. Children are taught to read the words by blending. When we say blending, you've got the sound or sound or sound, you blend it together. It's a bit like when you have a home or blender put in like an apple or banana and some strawberries and you make a little mixture to come out with one juice. Yeah. It's the same, you put your sounds together to make one word. And here we have, for example, m, a, t. Okay. Um, and it's not m, it's m, a, t. Okay. And it becomes fat. And there's a nice video, and it will show you a short part of it that you could have put at home. And the, the lady talks about why does phonics matter. She uses this. When I was taught, um, this, I was taught to say, mm, and mm, you see, and then up, ah, and then a t. Now, if I put those together, m, t, matter, that's a completely different word from mat. So you have what we call the pure sound, m mm, and mat. And you always do m and mat together. So you do the sounds, you blend, and you say the word. Okay. Um, in schools, it's done daily. And the more you can practice with them at home, the better. But you need to make sure that you are practicing with pure sounds. And we have a short video to share with you, and it's one you can look at at home, uh, where you can make sure you've got the m, mm, not the m, mm, the u, not the l, I was told l, you know. And that, that is a completely different sound sometimes. Okay, um, the next one. This is just an example of a school here in the UAE, in Sharjah. Uh, and you can see how rich the environment is with this whole sort of phonics approach. Okay. So some of the resources that your um, teachers will be using will be from here. So if we have a look, we've got some lovely posters. Ed, could you show us the posters? So this is just an alphabetic code, um, an alphabet chart. And you can see this, the capital, and you can see the lowercase. But you also have here directionality. Okay? And when you get sent things home from school, or when you have the Oxford Owl uh, parents club, you will see the directionality. It's very important while they're learning, as you were saying, to get that in the brain. So it's automatic. And it's using all the senses. It's using their sight. Using the sound, but it's also using their fingers so that they've got that touch there. Okay, now we have, let's take that one away. Come further forwards, mind wire. <laughs> this one's very interesting. This is a poster they will use in the classroom, it will be in every classroom. But we're going to look at this sound. Can you see this sound? S sound. Right? Look at all the different spellings. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like J, and we also the, the J and the G. So you've got like A is simple, one sound. But look at that. It can be uh, Teddy, it could be letter, the double T, or it could be the 
pants that drop, dropped. And the sound is a tone because it's where the P and the ED go together, drop. You can't say drop the lip, it's funny. But if you say dropped, the end sound is a T. So different spellings, so that's a very useful chart. And your teachers will be referring to that. Now, um, a parent came up to me once, um, I've had it twice now, and once in the brain, once here, and they were saying that their child was trying to read a word that said that the spelling was different. And I said, yes, that's right. So, you, you know, you might have learned cat, but when you've got the word cycle, it uh, begins with a, a C, but it's actually pronounced C. So if your child notices those things, that's really good, because they're beginning to notice that. You could just say, yes, that's the sound you've learned now, but this is also a different um, way. This is this sound that's also spelled in this way. Well done. You know? So you can encourage your children that way. Just even at home, when you've got things like, I you know, cereal boxes that have maybe English on them, and they might be reading the name of something, or,
some uh, French influences in the language. And that's why it becomes uh, a little bit more complex than um, a language that can be phonetically immediately sort of read. Um, so it, that's where we get our problems with writing and studying and reading. And it's not just like in an international setting, it's at home as well. So what we need to do is to teach them how to crack this code. Here's a quiz for you, short quiz. Approximately how many different sounds do we have in the English language? Anyone want to have a guess?
learn. Um, now, let's move on. Again, moving on to the next one. Okay, we add C. Look what we can do. We can make more words, cap. Now we've got something more complicated, scan. And a long word, pick. So we're not just starting with the three letters. We can actually even introduce something new. Let's add a K, kick. It's a little short. And of course you've got pick, chip, and kipper in your Robbie's phonics. Um, skin. And skips. I don't know about you, but I've noticed that children, they either run or they skip. I'm not going to demonstrate skipping. But my niece, when she was very happy as a child, and she still does it now, she's in her 20s, she skips. You know, it's part of that. So it's very nice to teach them that. Okay, and then look at it. And you've got to hear all those words that end with the sound K, but the letters are C and K. Sit. Screenshot of it. 
that um,
let's just think, how many words children would have heard by the time they were five years old? In, this is like a human in a native speaker environment. I would like to show us the first one. If they've never been read to, if they've just picked it up from being around their parents, their children, their friends, their family, around about 4,662 words. Next one. If they have been read to one or two times a week, you can see that the number of words they're exposed to dramatically increases. Go again. Three to five times a week. Look at the difference. Mm -hmm. Go again. Daily, look at that difference. So in your role in supporting your children and developing that love of reading, being able to master and crack that code of phonics as well is very, very important. Okay. And if you read five books a day, who has the time for that? But if you do, they may be reading Oh. Mm -hmm. 
which I need to know to help with my children's learning. There are simple but effective things you can do at home to support your child's growing chronic knowledge. My son, Malby and I, I play games together. To begin with, sharing nursery rhymes and singing songs together is one of the best ways of building a strong foundation for learning to read with colleagues. Another easy thing to do is to listen and talk about sounds your child can hear in the environment when you're out of the
So again, that's another important part of your role. It's like acting it. And did you notice it's time to go to bed? She looked at the child as well, and they went together. So some nice ways of reading with your children. Okay, let's go back to our So one of the things you can do is also just to talk, talk, talk about their reading. Talk about the pictures, talk about the people and their characters. Also talk about how do they feel? How do we know how they feel? Mm -hmm. What would you feel like? So you're bringing them into the story, into empathy with the characters as well. And it also makes them really good fun. Carry on. So we're going to sort of wrap up now, and then if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. If you want to come and look at our books afterwards, I'd love to too. Um, but first of all, what can you do to help? Learn those to your sounds, okay? Um, use the proper sonics routines. I think it's very important that what you do at home mirrors what they're doing in the school. If you're doing something slightly different and you teach, you know, you're, you're doing things that I might do, look. Um, listen to your children, read to you. So your school will send you home, will send you home things to read. Listen to them reading, help them like that the uh, perfect lady there in the first summer. And as much as you can, get them to talk about the story, get them to talk about what they're reading, and we talk about it together. Also, read books aloud to your child. And again, get them talking about what they're reading. So you can read with them something a little bit higher. It's also not too high, and they can access the story. That's the main thing. Okay. Um, continue to hear your children reading, but even when they're grown, we don't hear too. Okay, so that they get that fluency, they get that practice, and they show them, it shows you're interested in the, what they are actually able to do as well. And then chatter, 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 talk about everything, so we build up their knowledge in English. Um, I worked in uh, Myanmar, in the Ministry of Education there, and I, told, I was working with English teachers in Dublin schools. And I was on a training course with them, and I said, so, do you ever speak English at home? And they were like, no, why would we do that? So well, sometimes it can help expand their vocabulary. And I just left it at that. And they had the English one day a week, and the rest of it was all in Arabic. A few months later, I rang up one of these teachers at home, and I got this child on the phone, Mummy's not here. This teacher, taking the truth, I said, started speaking a little bit of English at home to this child. And the chance of the language of vocabulary came on in all I couldn't believe it. It was amazing. So um, it's just talking a lot sort of about it, uh, about reading what you can see in their stories and learning uh, English as much as you can. Um, that's the end, really. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it interesting and that it will inspire you to go back and explore. Support your children even more than you're already doing. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? You can come up and ask me questions as well.